Occupational English test. Practice test. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello Elizabeth, I'm Richard. I'm one of the nurses in this district, nursing. And uh, the doctor has asked me to see you, so I guess you know that. Yes, I do. All right, yeah. So please, please take a seat. Thank you. Right, yeah. So, how, how can I help you? Um, well, nurse, it's kind of bit complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I've got this problem with my back. All right. And it hurts very bad. All right, yeah. I, I've seen your case notes, and yes, I've seen that, yes. So, um, can you explain the situation you go through currently? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, well, uh, I experienced this discomfort and a very stiff feeling in my back. Mm. It's been long. All right. And uh, I used to use some pain relief ointment to relieve the symptoms, but obviously... Um, That's not working. working. All right, yeah. So, um, can you tell me when this started? It was uh, one and a half year ago mm -hmm. when the pain started. All I right. was prescribed with some painkillers back then. All right, yes. And uh, after 12 months, mm -hmm. uh, there was no relief in the pain. All right, so you have been uh, taking the medicines yes. consistently. All right, yes, yeah, okay. I well, I could not stand up. Oh, okay. Right. For which I was later hospitalized for, say, two days. Okay. And I underwent some uh, blood tests along with the beta meal. Oh, yeah. Water. All right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. So, so later, after six months, I was diagnosed with a tumor in my back. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, yeah. For which I underwent a surgery. Mm -hmm. And a small part of my bone that was removed. Okay. Uh, that's what was told to me and I was also told um, the tumor was spread to my liver oh, and right. my lower back and now that was very sad and I was I was worried right. about it. Right so you you said you were in terrible pain were, were you given some medicine for that? Yes I was um, pethidin three times per day mm -hmm. and uh, some alternative modalities for pain relief I tried acupuncture for say two months, which I discontinued later. Oh, so you felt that was not working? Yeah, it was not. Did you do something else for the pain? Yes, I did and I am still doing it. I smoke uh, marijuana. Marijuana? Yeah, dope. Okay, so uh, that's not the ideal thing you should be doing. I understand, but... Mm, right, yeah. yes. So, uh, what are your thoughts about what you are going through? That's the main reason I've come to you. you know, right, um, yeah. I've been depressed for quite a long time and I've been going through this rough phase. 
and I feel anxious about my illness. Uh, you know, even I get these weird thoughts of ending my life. I consider it suicide. I'm sorry but, to hear that. Yes, yeah. But um, I just want to get this over. Right, yes. I need help. Uh, yeah, but Elizabeth, uh, you know, that's not the, the way out actually. I know. See, I w wanted to see you because, you know, uh, there are a couple of things that the doctor wanted me to discuss with you. Okay. And uh, I would be arranging some counseling sessions for you. That would be great. Yes. Uh, so, um, if that's fine with you, I can get that rolling in a few days' time. Yes, of course. And uh, that's actually part of an ongoing um, modalities that the doctor wants for you. Okay. Right. And uh, I can also try, you know, some alternative modalities of pain relief okay all right and that would uh, include uh, many things including mm -hmm. acupuncture acupressure mm -hmm. and uh, yoga uh, i haven't tried it yet right Is, will it be uh, yes it, it has helped many people who okay. have you know gone through um, things similar to what you go through all right so those things should be helpful and uh, that is, they don't have any side effects actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should be seeing a specialist as well, if that's okay with you. That would be fine. Who would particularly help you through this phase of your life and help you to come out of what you are going through. Yeah. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Mr. Alexander, the physical exam's very consistent with some very bad back spasming, causing the pain you're in today. Well, I am in a lot of pain. I've been in a lot of pain for a little over a week now. Yeah. Uh, that's why I went to the emergency yeah. ward, because it just was unbearable. So, yeah. And I'm not sleeping well, neither, from this. Yeah, it's ex you're exhausted. I am, yeah. extremely. Well, this back pain, we can treat with some uh, medication for the pain, some uh, something for the back spasm as well, uh, exercises, and uh, a heating pad to make you feel better. Uh, most of the time, back pain will get better uh, with this conservative treatment. Well, that sounds nice, doctor. I mean, it sounds okay, but what I was thinking is that maybe I should have an MRI done because uh, I've think maybe something seriously is going on with my back, so... Tell me about that. Well, I'm concerned that something is uh, seriously wrong, like I may have a pinched nerve or a um, slip disc or something, and I figured an MRI could at least show if that's what's going on or roll it out, and, you know, be sort of like a peace of mind thing for me as well, so... Yeah, yes. Uh, I could see you're worried about it, and I, I would be too, but I have to tell you, uh, the physical exam today shows nothing more than the back spasm. It has none of these red flags we worry about, um, such as the weakness in the leg, uh, problems with the reflexes, or anything with this neurologic exam. It all came back normal today. Um, you had no fever in the history and no uh, problems that, uh, besides the pain that you're having from the lifting that you described. I know you're in a lot of pain um, and you're worried about it, uh, but most of my patients get better with this conservative treatment. Is there something else you're worried about? Uh, well, like I said, you know, it's been a problem for over a week now and I'm really concerned that something is wrong and that I'll never be able to work again or I'll be disabled yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, doctor, look, I, I did some research on my, you know, on my own. I, I went 
on the internet. I was reading up about, you know, what people do for their back pains. And, and I saw this guy, actually I saw a couple people, uh, who swear that after an MRI their back feels a lot better. Something to, uh, to do with the magnetism, I believe. It's in the machines or something. Okay. And I hear people using magnets to, you know, to help with back issues and other pains. Okay. So I'm thinking, well, you know, I can find out if something seriously is going on with the MRI. And at the same time, maybe feel better because of the magnets that are, you know, going on in the machine. So that's why I'm asking you to uh, give me a referral so I can get an MRI done. Yeah. I know you want to get better. I, I feel that from you. Uh, but the yeah. MRI has not been shown in the past to help alone, the magnetism. Uh, that's not something that it actually does. It's an imaging study. It just shows what's there. Um, you mentioned you wanted an MRI while we were doing the uh, physical, so I pulled out some uh, information for you about it. Because right. uh, the MRI um, can cause some harm, and uh, we don't want to do that. It's unnecessary uh, when you have this type of spasming pain. Um, a study shows that with people who get uh, MRIs within the first month of having back pain are eight times more likely to have surgery. And I don't think you're a candidate or we want you to have surgery at this point. No, I, I don't want surgery at this point. I don't want surgery at any point. Right. I just want my back to get better. And so I figured, you know, this MRI could, yeah. you know, show me if you know, anything's going on and maybe the magnets would help. But you're saying that that's pretty much no. a myth. No, I see back pain a lot. Most of my patients get better within four to six weeks with this conservative treatment we mentioned with the medication and exercises and heat. What do you feel about that? Well, it doesn't look like you're going to give me an MRI referral, so um, I mean, I'll try it, but if yeah. it doesn't work or if I have other symptoms going on, would we consider an MRI then? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I want you to get better, and I really think this is going to help you get better, and you will get better. Uh, and if not, I want you to call me, and I want to see you again in a few weeks to make sure you're getting better. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. Okay, your order sheet is in your chart. It's under the uh, tab that's labeled Physician's Orders. You're going to check these orders against your paper MAR. There's two pages to your paper MAR, your routine medicines and your PRN medicines. So first check your patient's name, Sally Gunter, Sally Gunter. Okay, then check for the date of birth, 5-8-41, 5-8-41. The next thing you want to look at is allergies. Sally is allergic to penicillin. Your allergy is penicillin. And you want to go down and you want to verify every medicine that they have. So on the order, it's potassium chloride, 40 milliequivalents, PO, three times a day. Potassium chloride, oral, liquid, 40 milliequivalents, PO, three times a day. K-Flex, 250 milligrams, PO, every six hours. K-Flex, 250 milligrams, PO, every six hours. Norvas, 5 milligrams, PO, twice a day. Norvas, 5 milligrams, PO, twice a day. Prilosec, 20 milligrams, PO daily. Prilosec, 20 milligrams, PO daily. When you're looking at your physician's order, make sure it has a date, a time, and a physician's signature. Sally Gunter also has a PRN order of clonidine. 
0.1 milligram tablet every six hours, PRN for a diastolic blood pressure greater than 90. Clonidine, 0.1 milligram tablet, PO every six hours, PRN for a diastolic blood pressure greater than 90. Now all your um, routine meds and your PRN meds are checked against your physician's order sheet. The next thing you want to do is to look here. Number one is compare your order sheet to your MAR and then your initial when once verified. So you would sign your initials that you verified these medicines. Question 26. Now read the question. Let's examine this. If I have the fearful thought that I could ultimately lose everything, then it's not going to move me forward. It's not going to help me think clearly. It's not going to help me, you know, move forward and take, take the actions that I need to take. It can kind of limit me and make me feel like I don't want to do anything because I'm scared to do anything. But what I have found, and this is what I do all the time, is when I'm having a fearful thought, I know that I can't not think about something. Because the more you try to not think about something, the more you're just going to think about it. So you have to replace that thought. And what I replace that thought with is, how can I use this fearful thought or use this fearful event to make me a better person, a better nurse, and to learn from this experience? I'm happy to share this with you so that you can, you know, hopefully learn from my mistakes. Um, so what happened was I realized that I made the mistake, and not only had I made the mistake once, I had actually did it. I had actually done it the first time I administered the medication as well. So I thought about it, and I was like, okay. Well, of course, I have to do an incident report. With the mistake, I'm going to show her that I can, you know, not only take care of the situation and have her trust me with her patients, but she can also see that I'm a very confident person and that this mistake won't happen again. So I went to her and I said, you know, I told her the mistake, you know, ultimately told her what happened and, you know, it was a mistake and we examined it and, you know, she asked me a few questions and it was an uncomfortable situation, but what I realized was that I came out of that as well as I possibly could have. Having the Lack of confidence, you can replace that with, no matter what happens, I will build from this and I will learn from this and I will ultimately become a better person. So guys, it's all about replacing those fearful thoughts with thoughts that are going to serve you. Question 27. Now read the question. I was actually talking about culture-bound phenomena and I had a professor of psychology say to me that there's no evidence that culture-bound or cultural illness exists. And I actually said to him, my response to him was that you're absolutely correct. And people were quite surprised when I said you're absolutely correct in the world in which you live. So you actually can't necessarily blame someone if they've never actually been exposed to it before. So the important point is, is that if you actually don't have it in a framework that, that most people, and, and what I'm talking about is mainstream, can relate to, in that it's actually researched and it's written up in a scientific journal, then they're actually forced to relate to it, or at least open their you know, um, mindset up to a different reality. Question 28. Now read the question. Hello, I'm Jan Machescu. I called this morning. Yes, Mr. Machescu, your prescriptions are right here. They've been ready for an hour. Good. 
good. Now, take these pills three times a day. That's every eight hours. I usually take them at seven in the morning, three in the afternoon, and one before I go to bed about 10 or 11 at night. That's fine. When do I take the other pills? You can take these any time you feel a pain. Well, it's almost lunchtime. Is it okay if I take one before lunch? It's better if you wait until after lunch, after you've eaten. Well, why is that? The pills may upset your stomach if it's empty. Oh, okay. I'll wait till after lunch. I'll take one about one o'clock this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much for your help. You're welcome. Question 29. Now read the question. Right, I'd like to tell you about all the patients on this ward, starting with bed one. John Smith is a 45-year-old male who had a motorbike accident on his way home from work. He was admitted to the ED at 2300 hours on the 1st of August with a frontal lobe contusion. Sorry, I don't know that word contusion. Could you please explain? Sure, in this case, it means a concussion. Thank you. He has breaks in his right arm and hand and has had surgery, including metal plates inserted into his arm. He also has deep grazes on his left knee and ankle and stitches in his right hip and shoulder. Stitches in the right hip and shoulder? Yes, that's right. All dressings have been changed this morning uh, at 900 hours. He's on a self-administered morphine drip and he's also on an antibiotic drip. Um, he has had injections to prevent blood clotting and his pain is quite manageable with the medication he's on. Question 30. Now read the question. I worked for this man called Graham, that wasn't his real name. He started to hear voices, he had strong paranoid beliefs that people were talking about him. He had to come into hospital and the main way of actually helping overcome that loneliness and isolation as a result of his experiences was to really enter his world, to develop a shared model, a shared understanding of how these experiences um, shaped his beliefs and how that made him feel both emotionally and how he reacted behaviourally by avoiding a whole range of situations. It makes me feel really good actually and it gives me a tremendous source of satisfaction that actually by relating to somebody, by understanding somebody, that you can actually empower them and help them recover. Without the benefits of professional help, Graham would still be stuck at home, he would still be experiencing rather distressing voices. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, Choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. Extract one, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
As a physiotherapist of 22 years, I've been asked all sorts of questions, but the one I hear most often is, can physiotherapy help my condition? Physiotherapy assesses, diagnoses, treats and prevents a wide range of health conditions and movement disorders. It helps reduce pain and repair damage while increasing mobility and improving quality of life. In some instances, it can be an effective replacement for surgical intervention. Obviously, not all conditions can be cured by physiotherapy alone, but help it can certainly do. So today, I'd like to focus on a condition that still creates controversy when mentioned alongside physiotherapy, and that is scoliosis. Can physiotherapy make an impact on someone suffering from this condition, in particular mild to moderate scoliosis? Let's find out. Scoliosis isn't always easy to treat, but understanding this condition and its related issues will help a physiotherapist determine the best possible options. A scoliotic spine has one or more curves to either side exceeding 10 degrees. It can resemble a C or an S shape. What makes it difficult to treat is that the majority of cases have no known cause. Two specific types are easier to deal with, however. Structural scoliosis, which results from the development of the musculoskeletal system, and functional scoliosis, which occurs from muscle imbalances, leg length discrepancies, and inflammation of the tissues. These both have definite causes, allowing us to create an individualised and comprehensive treatment plan. Physiotherapy is but one part of the multidisciplinary network of healthcare professions employed in the treatment of scoliosis. A confirmed diagnosis comes firstly from a thorough physical examination for any abnormalities and asymmetry. If scoliosis is suspected, then an X-ray will be taken to confirm what's known as the patient's Cobb angle, or severity of the scoliosis. From here, physiotherapists work closely with doctors, including orthopaedic spine specialists, in determining the best options going forward. I believe a good, multifaceted approach to this is ideally broken down into four distinct phases. The first of these, in my programme, is pain relief. Although not all scoliosis sufferers will experience pain or even discomfort, many do, and for these patients, the provision of pain relief assists with compliance and also with corrective or prevention exercises. Physiotherapists have a variety of techniques for achieving this, such as the releasing of tight muscles through gentle massage, acupuncture, the use of supportive postural taping, and various electrotherapy modalities such as ultrasound. Phase 2 is a particularly important step for several reasons. It's for rectifying any imbalances through stretching and strengthening exercises. This often still includes taping techniques until strength and flexibility have increased. Physiotherapy here focuses on both sides of the spine as well as adjacent areas like the hip or shoulder, depending on what's impacting spinal alignment. The aim is to restore the range of motion of the spine, muscle length and strength, as well as endurance and core stability. This stage is paramount for allowing ongoing treatment in phase 3 to occur. This is because it's there that the patient requires the strength and flexibility gained in phase 2 in order to resume normal activities. These include sport and recreation, which is the objective most patients have in mind during the treatment process. It's where we aim to restore full function. This is where we as physiotherapists need to tailor rehabilitation to the specific patient so they can safely achieve their functional goals. This of course includes trained athletes who place great stress upon their bodies, so caution must be taken when giving advice, and strong encouragement is needed for keeping to realistic recovery times. The final phase is undoubtedly the most important in terms of full recovery, and this is the prevention of a recurrence. 
This relies heavily on the partnership between physiotherapist and patient. By this, I mean we identify the optimal exercises for the patient to continue, and it's then up to them to maintain these exercises throughout the course of their life. Here too, other professions may be utilised. For example, in a case of an unequal leg length, a podiatrist could address this with a heel rise, shoe rise or built-up foot orthotic. What patients expect to achieve and what is achieved varies greatly. However, those with mild to moderate scoliosis who have a commitment to maintaining their newfound strength and flexibility can expect a full recovery, especially if diagnosed and treated early. Physiotherapy is a vital part of this recovery and prevention and should never be underestimated. So, the next time you're asked, can physiotherapy help my condition, I'd be inclined to give a firm nod and respond by saying, with your commitment, physiotherapy is invaluable. Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Tell me a little bit about, about the progress in the plant-based movement recently. There's been tremendous progress, particularly in the health field. At least that's, I mean, that's certainly my perspective. Um, so in the States, there's just been a, a real surge, a real tipping point in terms of the plant-based uh, nutrition movement. There are now entire conferences. There's an international plant-based nutrition health care conference. Hundreds of physicians, other medical professionals get together, talk about how they're using this in their practice. I mean, that didn't exist a few years ago. I mean, it's really, really exciting. There's new vegan medical clinics opening up where all the folks on staff are using lifestyle medicine approaches, not just to prevent disease, but to stop and reverse it as well. Mm, tell me about the main players involved. You've got Nutrition Facts growing, you've got the Physicians Committee doing a lot of work. Um, who are the main players and what's been achieved specifically in the last few months and last year? What's been the memorable moment for you? Well, so, you know, a lot of people don't know about Scott Stoll, who started this, uh, the uh, um, PBNHC, this, uh, this plant nutrition project, this um, uh, plant-based nutrition conference. He's been doing these immersion programs for Whole Foods for a long time now. Um, he has a book coming out. Okay. I'm very excited about that. Um, he's just had transformative experiences. You know, he's just a physician in practice. There's people all over who've been doing this in their own little, you know, hometowns. But it's just great to get so many people together, start networking. 
Um, uh, so there's wonderful resources out now, documentaries, you know, we got a number of documentaries coming up, like The Game Changers and uh, Eat Yourself Alive, and I mean, it's just, this is an exciting time mm. to be in the movement. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of it is just, there's so much, uh, I mean, we're going to get there if only because the healthcare costs are spiraling out of control, right? climate change. I mean, we're just going to be forced to have to take these, you know, safe, simple, side effect free solutions, cheaper, safer, more effective than conventional medical approaches, because we're talking about the leading killers, right, the leading cause of death. I mean, the good news is, is that the vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. We have the power, we have tremendous power over our medical destiny and longevity. You talk passionately about the benefits of a uh, plant-based diet, particularly reversing heart disease. My old boss, he was a professor of epidemiology called Professor Tim Spector. He said mm. he met Dr. Dean Ornish. Mm. Dr. Dean Ornish said, the thing with the plant-based movement is you get the sense you're either with them or against them. We're going to talk mm. about that in a minute. But also what he said was there aren't any uh, large randomized controlled trials. He said, Dr. Dean Ornish, show me the large random... Why aren't there any? If we've known about this since Pritikin's day, Where's the data, the large randomized controlled trials? Well, look, I mean, Ornish published uh, his first RCT, randomized controlled trial, July 1990, in The Lancet, the most prestigious medical journal in the world. There it was, black and white, proving with quantitative angiography that we can reverse heart disease, open up arteries without drugs, without surgery, just a healthy plant-based diet and other lifestyle changes. There it was. Right? So we've known about it for decades, but there it was published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, The Lancet, JAMA, yet, what happened? Nothing. Hundreds of thousands of people continue to die of a reversible, preventable disease. So it's being ignored. It's being lost down the rabbit hole and ignored. I said, well, wait a second. If the, effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost like then, what else is there in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion? I made it my life's mission to find out. That's why I started NutritionFacts.org, and that's why I wrote my new book, How Not to Die. What I find very interesting is you say the system needs to take on board this message, but the whole point of Nutrition Facts was to go around the system. Tell me a little about, bit about the, the democratization of information and the role that's played and why that's been good for the, the movement, I guess. You know, I, when I started out, I started out ignoring the general public and going straight, you know, to, trying to train the trainers effectively, going around speaking at all the medical schools in the States to uh, try to, you know, get the next generation of doctors educated. But then I realized that's a slow way about it. We don't have time. People are dying now. I don't need to, you know, for another 10 years for them to kind of slowly take over the uh, medical system. People are dying now. We need to take this directly to the people. And thankfully, thanks to the internet age, we have now have this democratization of information. Now everyone has access. Before, the doctors had a monopoly on information about health. And so, big pharma, the food industry, all they had to do is get to the doctors. The tobacco industry, as long as they could get the AMA on board by writing them checks for $10 million, and so they came out opposed to the Surgeon General's report against smoking in 1964, as long as they, get, as long as they control the doctors, they control the health ministers. No longer. Now, people can get to the science directly, educate themselves, and, 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 and we can't wait until society catches up to the science because it's a matter of life and death. USDA, um, I've read their mission is to expand markets for agricultural products. But at the same time, they're coming out with the dietary guidelines. Is that one of the challenges you have in the States? The USDA has an inherent conflict of interest. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, look, the same thing happened here in Great Britain, right? There was the Ministry of Food and Forestry, right? And then the, the mad cow debacle came, mm -hmm. and they basically dissolved the department, right? Put, pu put you know, food safety in charge of, you know, medical professionals in charge of food safety instead of agricultural professionals. Same conflict of interest exists in the States. U.S. Department of Agriculture has this dual mission to promote agricultural products. That's what they're there for. But also, we put them in charge of food safety, meat inspections, come, helping to come up with the nutrition guidelines. So when it comes to eat more messaging, the message is clear. Eat more fruits and vegetables. There it is, right there in black and white, the dietary guidelines. But what about 
eat less messaging. Then there's a conflict. So what do you get? Instead of eat less meat, eggs, dairy, junk, what do they say? Eat less saturated and trans fatty acids, things like that. Biochemical components, right? Because they don't want to mention foods because that's too politically unpalatable. But they'll mention vegetables, they'll mention fruits. Well, they'll mention fruits and vegetables because it's an eat more messaging. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Promote agricultural products and promote health. If they can do it without uh, undermining the profit motive, they'd be happy to make the American public healthier. Can you just explain a little bit about um, how corrupt the medical industry is uh, in the U.S.? It's kind of related to what you've talked about already. Well, there's a number of barriers for doctors. So you say, okay, we understand why some of the mainstream medical associations are sucking up to industry because they're being sponsored by Big Pharma, for example. But why aren't individual doctors speaking out? Well, there's a severe nutrition deficiency in doctors in education. We just weren't taught this in medical school, so we graduate without these powerful tools in our medical toolbox. We just weren't, we just weren't taught how to teach people to take better care of themselves. right? Um, uh, but of course, there's other barriers. There's lack of time, lack of reimbursement. Doctors aren't paid um, to tell uh, people how to take better care of themselves. Um, and also, there's um, there's you know much of medical education, both uh, during medical school and postgraduate medical education, is paid for by the drug industry. I mean, the number one reason people go to their doctor in North America is what are called blood pressure checks, and they keep going to get their blood pressure checks so they can tweak the blood pressure medications. And so that's a boon, not only to Big Pharma, which sell these chronic disease drugs that people take every single day for the rest of their lives because they're not actually treating the cause of their disease, right? Because they're not actually changing their diet. So they need to be treated every day for the rest of their lives. So it's a boon to the Big Pharma. But also, that's where the doctor is getting their next BMW from and sending their kids to college. I mean, the, the most common, it's the bread and butter of the GPs, of the, of the primary care docs, is these blood pressure checks, which wouldn't be necessary if they didn't have high blood pressure. The number one killer risk factor in the world, 9 million people dying of high blood pressure, a disease that need not occur if people, a plant-based diet, something we've known since the 1920s. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.